pero hace algunos años, por primera vez, había una esperanza de democracia. Mr. Ambassador, for us this is a period of change. The idea is to convert our country from a semi-colonial dependent nation into a Guatemala that is free and independent. The goal behind all these reforms is to create a modern, economically viable society, but to raise the standard of living for the most people possible. We can't continue to simply give away every resource that we have. Mr. President, I don't have to tell you there's a lot of alarm in Washington about all the goings on down here. And there's not exactly too much time to fool around. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, allow me to speak freely. The problem between our nations is united fruit. Imagine if in your country there was a foreign corporation that owned all the finest land. Then imagine that the means of getting your products to market, the ships, the ports, the railroads, were all owned by the same company. Not only do they own your entire economic infrastructure, but in 50 years, they have paid virtually no taxes. Look, <clears throat> the government of the United States is not going to permit a red Soviet republic between Texas and the Panama Canal. Oh, Mr. Ambassador, I am certain that when you have been here longer and have had an opportunity to get to know our country, you will feel differently about all this. No matter how long I'm here, nothing's going to make me a communist. I can tell you something else. That line doesn't have much appeal for the American people either. You clean those reds out of your government. When United Fruit gets what is properly theirs, maybe then we'll talk about bettering relations. I'm afraid time is getting very short. Greetings, comrades, and buenvenidos, compañeros, to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. We're coming at you this week with part two of our Revolutionary Politics in Central and South America series on Piero de Jesus's Shattered Hope, the Guatemalan Revolution in the United States from 1944 to 1954. We hope you enjoyed part one last week. We're going to get right down to business today, but you can anticipate in part two that we're going to really focus on Jacobo Arbenz's presidency, all the complex developments of Decree 900 and Agrarian reform all the way up unto the tragic fall of Arbenz and his exile out of Guatemala. We'll do some quick wrap up and then leave you with some things to contemplate and reflect on with the lost horizon, the lost future of communist development in Guatemala in the mid-50s. Before we jump in, let's just quickly run down the logistical housekeeping items for Red Library that we do each and every week. If you like what we do here on the show and you'd like to support us monetarily, materially, remember to go down in those show links, find our Patreon page, and for as little as $1 a month, that's roughly a quarter per episode, you can get access to our Discord server for patrons. We have amazing discussions, amazing book groups, movie nights, just really all around excellent community building that's going on there. So big shout out to all of our patrons who are already very active and engaged there. It's turned out to be one of the most awesome and humbling parts of doing this show. Remember to like the show on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. If you are listening on iTunes, please go down, give us one of those star reviews, maybe write us a line or two about what you think of the work that we're doing here as that helps us find more and more potential comrade listeners all across the globe helps get Red Library's message out there. Last but not least, please remember that Red Library is part of the Lost Horizons podcasting network, along with our pod rads at From78 and The Regrettable Century. Remember, you can find our Lost Horizons network podcast. We usually release one of those a month, and it's a general roundtable style discussion of a rotating cast of characters from all three shows discussing all sorts of things related to lost futures, leftist politics, psychoanalysis, and really just trying to make sense of all this work we do on our shows for our own personal lives. All right, y'all, let's do this thing. Part two of Shattered Hope. We hope you enjoy and we'll see you back here afterward. Part two of Shattered Hope by Piero Lejesas. I'm here with 
CC Don yet again. What's up, CC Don? Hey, it's a day. It is a day. It is a day. It's a week. It's a year. Uh-huh. It's a kalpa. It's an yeah. epoch. <laughs> yeah. It's a. It's a millennium. Yeah, it's a. It's a reality. <laughs> it is yeah. a reality. So, so I've heard, or not. <laughs> we really don't know. Uh, so it's a simulated one, but it's a, it's a reality. That's though. true. Is it still a reality, even if it's simulated? Yeah. It, yeah. It's a, it's a simulated reality. Yeah. It's also a society, even if it's simulated. I mean, we're <laughs> we are in one. Last time I heard from our favorite Facebook page, we are still in a society. We're not going to explain that joke <laughs> at all. We won't do that to our beautiful Tramrad listeners across the globe. So no, no. we are back for part two of the history of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala. I know it's been a few weeks since we recorded part one. And I asked you this already, but just for the formality of doing it on the show. No, I do not have anything I'd like to Brilliant. add before we All start. All right, good. I don't either. So we left off with Arevalo in the United States response to Arevalo's presidency. And now moving in, we are starting around 1950, I believe July 1950. Uh, we're starting at the presidency of Jacobo Arbenz. And chapter seven, fittingly enough, is called The World of Jacobo Arbenz. All right. Uh, what was your take on that first part in terms of the history of Arevalo and, and some of the historical context leading up to, to Arbenz. Was there any anything you found really surprising or interesting? I know I'm going <laughs> to do this to you every single time. Yeah, you put me on the spot, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to leave that in. Uncut. <laughs> no, no, I mean, what about you, man? Any, any comments you wanted to make before we, we jump in head first? No, not really. I mean, I guess thinking back on part one and, and kind of where we're starting with part two, I... I think for me, most of the history that I have been exposed to about Guatemala in this era, it almost like starts right here. Like the normal narrative begins with Arbenz's presidency without the the history of Arevalo. And it's hard to think of them as two completely distinct periods in Guatemala's history. So Mm -hmm. I think for me, just and for listeners as well, if this is new history, typically the narrative starts around now. Right. Let's just do this. So we uh, kind of similar to part one. We got a lot of history to do. Um, yeah, it's a lot dense. Of ground to cover. A lot of ground to cover. So we're going to do our best to to keep it on point, efficient, um, but hopefully have some flexibility to talk about specifics as they come up. We left off talking about Arevalo and the United States response or understanding of Arevalo's presidency. And just to begin, let's kind of lay out a little bit for Arbenz's presidency that he is going to, again, kind of really go against a lot of people's expectations of what his presidency was going to be, that he was going to be maybe a little bit more amenable to U.S. interests. He was a military officer officer. Maybe he wouldn't be too radical. Again, they were predicting because of his military and and class background that he wasn't going to be a threat. And he wasn't going to rock the boat a little bit in terms of foreign policy and and political relations in the area. But Arbenz is going to actually go against a lot of what people expected of him. And he's really going to seek to carve out three really dangerous paths that tragically are going to increasingly isolate him and eventually lead to his overthrow and his exile out of Guatemala. So a lot of what we're going to talk about with the second part of this episode and and this history is going to focus on kind of three things. One, agrarian reform and the impact of that and the radicality of that his defiance of U.S. influence, and his increasingly close ties with the Communist Party and his way of actually understanding his project in Guatemala as being an explicitly Marxist communist one, albeit very nationalist and critical of the Soviet Union or distance from it, but still very much a Marxist communist project. Maybe kind of on this note, it's, it's interesting, I think, to talk about the different perspectives of how agrarian reform and, and Arbenz's project was sort of interpreted by people across the political spectrum. There are going to be distinct ways that his presidency is looked back on now, depending on someone's political orientation. So conservatives see him as really just this man driven by ambition and greed. A lot of more radicals kind of see him as this petite bourgeois military officer who was either unwilling or unable to deepen the revolution once it actually got started. So they kind of see him as basically failing to go through the project fully. And, you know, they usually reduce that to his sort of like class background. Mm -hmm. And liberals kind of adopt him as this liberal reformer who was just kind of like suckered by the communist party. It was like, oh, he got like duped by Fortuny and like the other more radical parties to sort of almost like implement their project against his own will. 
And the truth is, is that like none of these are really accurate to what actually was going on. And I think that's what Lehesis really offers is I think he offers a really nuanced, complex picture of who Arbenz was and what the actual political context was that led to him making this, the decisions that he did in his eventual downfall. Let's talk for a minute about Arbenz's wife because Arbenz becoming more and more communist, more influenced by Marxism is really kind of directly a result of her influence. So, so I think we mentioned this on part one, but Maria Arbenz was Salvadoran. She was raised in a fairly upper class, like elite sort of class in El Salvador. And basically, she introduced Arbenz to Marxism through the Communist Manifesto. The way that I think they both kind of started to adopt Marx is that they saw Marx not as a perfect source or a perfect inspiration for how to think about revolutionary politics and changing the basic social and and material conditions of Guatemala, but they thought he was the best source at the time to help them interpret Guatemala's history. And I find that really interesting. It was really about interpreting Guatemala's history in a particular way without necessarily feeling like you had to reduce everything to some like Marxist historical materialist analysis. I mean, an interesting little detail though is that Arbenz himself did not become a member of the PGT until 1957. And so the PGT, remember, was the Communist Party of Guatemala. So actually it wasn't even until he would had been or at least like had vacated the presidency and gone into exile, it was like three years later that he actually became like a card carrying communist, which I find oh. just, you know, really sort of strange and bizarre and just completely left out of all the history yeah, that I've no, known. It's not expected. Huh. He becomes more radicalized after being introduced to Marxism um, through his wife, and he becomes more and more disenchanted with Guatemala's revolutionary parties and their ability to actualize their visions. So I also find this really interesting thinking about our own context of how, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not uncommon for people to get involved in like radical revolutionary parties or politics and then to become disenchanted at the seeming inability to actually carry through any of their actual plans and stated goals. And it's important to remember that Fortuny, who was a, a you know very high ranking member in the Communist Party of Guatemala, that him and Arbenz became very, very close and very, very good friends. And so Fortuny and Maria Arbenz are these two key influential figures in his life who are going to like push him more and more communist or at least you know are going to influence him and open him up to that perspective so before when you're talking about him becoming more radicalized about what time how much earlier than his presidency did this happen was this like when he's pretty young still or is this like when he was in high level politics actually i think it was whenever he was in high level politics okay. i think a lot of this happened in between 1946 1947 and him actually taking over the presidency okay. Okay. so i know that he had been influenced to a large degree and that's why whenever he he does step into the presidency, it's going to be pretty fast that he starts to push agrarian reform. Mm. So he had already sort of developed, I think, his own like Marxist influence, understanding Guatemala and what needed to be done. And that's, I think, why he was able to push it so fast as soon as he gets into mm. office. And maybe a reason why the the people around him didn't expect him to because it just happened relatively recent in his life. So. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think that's actually a really great point. I think, you know, again, everyone seemed to interpret him in this particular way. I think it's because he was definitely like much more quiet, a little bit more reserved than Arevalo was. Mm-hmm. And I think people just didn't really expect that he was going to have this like passionate, really, I think, strong commitment to radical revolutionary politics. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was almost like he flew under the radar a little bit and then he gets into office and then everyone is like, wow, he's doing something no one really expected. Again, they thought he was going to be this like docile, fairly middle of the road military officer. Yeah. Yes, I did. I did say <laughs> docile on purpose. <laughs> you going to say it? Of course. Time to go docile. Time to go mobile. But he did not. He did the opposite yeah, yeah. of that. <laughs> okay, so in 1951, he again, he takes office. Everyone thought that the revolution had peaked under Arevalo. But he immediately begins discussions for agrarian reform with the three communist leaders. So that's Fortuny, Gutierrez, and Yunama. They introduced the first draft of agrarian reform legislation into parliament in 1952. So April of 1952. He first introduced this first draft of agrarian reform into into Congress in April 1952. So not surprisingly, the landed elite strongly speak out and the church is very much in alignment with the landed elite to push back on agrarian reform. Again, the church at this time in Guatemala, very much an institution of political stability and reaction. Revolutionary leaders were shocked with Arbenz's introduction of the draft into Congress because he basically didn't really consult them. It's kind of like, from what I remember, they had like loosely talked about it, but it wasn't like an official unified decision that they were going to introduce this policy of agrarian reform. Arbenz seemed to do it kind of 
of his own volition, even though he had discussed it with them to some degree. But again, it kind of took them by surprise. And so in some ways, you know, you got to ask, like, how uh, how much of a liberal reformer mm. was Arbenz if he actually kind of like made a much more radical move than the revolutionary parties were sort of willing to make at the time, or at least seemed to kind of exceed what they were they were ready to do. I was going to say, do you have a sense when it says shocked, is this, a, is this like a good shocked or is this like an angry shocked? Uh, I think it was like surprised and definitely a little angry. Okay. I mean, mm. I don't, I do not think even the revolutionary parties expected Arbenz to move this quickly mm. on something as radical as grain reform. Because if you remember for Ravelo, with his spiritual socialist kind of philosophy, right, right. the one thing he would not touch was agrarian reform, and Arbenz moves on it incredibly quick mm. as soon as he gets into office. So we're going to talk about this specifically, but the agrarian reform legislation, the policy, which is called Decree 900, was actually signed into law on June 17th, 1952. So, and I'm going to read a quick paragraph just to give you an idea of what Lahesa says about this. So he says, it was the preparation and the enactment of the agrarian reform bill that finally brought Arbenz over to the communist side. By late 1952, President Arbenz had chosen the stand from which he would not deviate. His closest political friend was the PGT, and his closest personal friends were its leaders. Arbenz continued to read, quote, he read books on the Russian Revolution, the history of the USSR, the military strategy of the Soviet generals in World War II, all of this molded his way of looking at the world, observes Fortuny. By 1952, quote, through all of his reading, adds his wife, so Maria, Jacobo was convinced that the triumph of communism in the world was inevitable and desirable. The march of history was toward communism. Capitalism was doomed, unquote. Which to me was just like a powerful statement from the two people closest to him of his actual commitment to a communist horizon and a communist sort of radical project. Mm -hmm. So the one thing about Arbenz, and again, this is where a bit of the, the kind of tragic, you know, threads that are going to undermine his own project start to really show up. So Arbenz and others underestimated the U.S. threat, but they also saw that a capitalist phase was needed in Guatemala before full transition to socialism, communism. So, you know, they are adopting this kind of more orthodox understanding of like you have to pass through capitalist development before you can get to socialism and communism. Again, they're not completely against capitalism developing more strongly in Guatemala. So again, they're kind of wanting to follow that more orthodox track. And at the same time, they're also underestimating like the U.S. threat and how much the U.S. would be threatened by Arbenz's project. So he believed eventually socialism was destined for the whole world and could come to Guatemala before the U.S. And I think this is, again, really interesting and radical. So even though Guatemala would one day become Marxist-Leninist, the way that Arbenz thought, the task at hand and of the day was agrarian reform. So again, they kind of saw agrarian reform as the first priority in this larger communist Marxist-Leninist project. So let's move on to chapter eight and talk specifically about some, some aspects of the agrarian reform of Decree 900. Arbenz's economic goal was basically to transform semi-feudal Guatemala into an economically independent modern capitalist economy. Even though this reform is going to be incredibly radical, especially for the context, it's still seeking to basically strengthen Guatemala's development as a capitalist nation, at least at first. It also sought to transform the political structures and the physical infrastructure of Guatemala itself. So basically the idea was to transform serfs into citizens. Again, because if you remember at the time, like the vast majority of Guatemala is mostly indigenous people like working in the countryside and in rural areas. And I think what's really interesting about this is that they tried to do it without relying on foreign capital, which was not unexpected, basically to marginalization by U the US and the World Bank. So they knew that they were going to be marginalized by the larger financial institutions of power. So I think it's kind of an interesting like strategic move to say, we know that we're not going to be able to rely on foreign capital, but what they could rely on was was the basic legacy of those high coffee prices from Arevalo's era, and hopefully with a bit of luck too. So they knew that if they had those high coffee prices and with luck on their side, they might be able to actually develop in a way that didn't have to rely on the larger global capitalist order, especially post-World War II, where, you know, after Bretton Woods, the World Bank, the IMF, the US, you know, exert increasingly tremendous control over economic and monetary policy that spans the globe. I'm gonna read just a quick note that Lahesis has about land expropriation and redistribution. This is a little bit of just specifics of land expropriation. So under Decree 900, it stipulated that all uncultivated land in private estates of more than 672 acres would be expropriated. Idle land in estates of between 224 and 672 acres would be expropriated only if less than two thirds of the estate was under cultivation. Estates of less than 224 acres would not be affected. By contrast, the government-owned fincas nacionales would be entirely parceled out. 
Land expropriated from private estates would be given in private ownership or in lifetime tenure according to the recipient's wishes. In the latter case, upon the death of the beneficiary, his family would receive preferential consideration to rent the same land. The fincas nacionales would be distributed in lifetime tenure only. The former owners would be compensated with a 3% agrarian bond. Maturing in 25 years, the value of the expropriated land would be that declared by the owners on their tax returns prior to May 10th, 1952, the day of the agrarian reform bill had been presented to Congress. Essentially, I wanted to just read some specifics because even though this land reform and Decree 900 is incredibly radical for the context, it isn't as if it just completely divested everyone of all land, period. It had very specific limitations and it really focused on the major like corporate and wealthy elite landholders in Guatemala at the time. So I think it's really important to just kind of recognize that for all its radicality, it was still, again, like kind of tame. It definitely had like flexibility and considerations for sort of like middle-sized land owners and, and, you know, elite families as well. Decree 900 used a hierarchical system to implement reform of who got the land. And it expressly excluded courts and expropriation processes and determination. So again, it's trying to take this out of this like entrenched bureaucratic legal system and sort of allow for a more independent way to decide who gets what. So was this by excluding the courts did and this hierarchical system, was it basically a, like a, a new hierarchy that was created to deal with this specifically or was he using a, a one that was already in place? That's a good question. I think we're going to talk about that in just a moment because there is going to be some tension and some potential of the courts to basically try to push back on this. Okay. Um, but I think in general he did sort of like utilize the party structure and like okay, maybe okay. I think some of the revolutionary parties as well to sort of help figure out who was going to get what. Yeah, sure. And I also think that my understanding of Lehesis' book, I think the idea is, is that he was very specifically trying to take it out of the courts per se mm. to sort sort of like get locked up into legal battles or to be able to push back on this legally because in a lot of ways a lot of the entrenched like elite bureaucratic class essentially they were the judges were were sort of very much representative of those interests yeah courts are almost always a conservative force right <laughs> spicy takes here today on shattered hope part two <laughs> No, it's, that's, that's, that's just a high degree of sarcasm for me. <laughs> Signs the first of three decrees for land reforms on January 5th, 1953, which proceeds swiftly over the next 18 months. So again, this is like something he starts moving on initially, but it's going to take roughly about two years or so for the whole actual uh, Decree 900 to really go into effect. Now, it's important to say here that, you know, in any situation, and I think we see this in almost any other kind of radical revolutionary situation where you know, sometimes for millennia, relations of land ownership, the landed gentry, you know, entrenched class interest, uh, radical social inequality, you know, you try to upend the system overnight, there are going to be mistakes. And there's going to be certain aspects of this that are difficult to control. And just to get back to your question, and, and this is what I was thinking about. So I guess Decree 900 set up committees that were basically going to focus on overseeing the distribution and expropriation of the land. And it's important to say that mistakes did occur by those committees. And they were essentially, you know, they were strongly biased against the landowners in which they were expropriating the land from, I think, for, for very good reason. And there was some violence occurring at, you know, roughly mid-sized large estates. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, it's just to say that, you know, you sort of overturn these these relations that have been there for generations upon generations. People are going to have a lot of pent-up anger and rage and frustration over, you know, violence, exploitation, all the things they've gone through. And it's important to say like, yeah, there were, you know, definitely some mistakes and some violence that did occur. A lot of the local agrarian tensions that emerged in this process, you know, also we've seen this, I think we've talked about this with things like the logic of violence and civil war. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this radical social change and a lot of times communities become divided internally. And a lot of those interests and personal sort of uh, grudges and relationships kind of play out in the background of this larger social change. There's a lot of like local politics and micro politics that can get used or can get sort of weaponized in these battles. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it seems like, you know, you saw this a lot happening in China with like landlords and the Cultural Revolution. I think you see it here happening in Guatemala as well. So I think it's just important to recognize like there's a reason why that's happening. I mean, think about this. I know we've talked about this a great deal. Like look at Iraq or Afghanistan. I mean, in some ways you overturn like the main things that keep a social order stable, regardless of how exploitative and violent and oppressive it is. A lot of like those micro political grudges are going to, you know, 
kind of use that larger change to to sort of work towards our own ends. I don't think there should be anything that like fundamentally negates a larger sort of project just because that seems to be a pretty common thing across a lot of different political and historical developments. Right, right. One of the other things that that Lehesa says was a mistake is that a lot of the landowner property was grossly undervalued in the process. And the U.S. and the opposition were, of course, outraged by that process because obviously that's, you know, that's their bread. Was part of it undervalued because of what they reported on their taxes? That's a good question. I don't know if Le- Lehesis talks about that specifically. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, from what I remember, I think it, you know, in some ways it's like they were already like undervaluing their land. That's mm-hmm. how they were getting out of like the, all the taxes that they should have been yeah, paying, yeah. like we discussed in part one. So I don't know if it was like, in some ways like the committees used the taxes to mm-hmm. precisely like put it back right. on them and be okay. like, oh, well, your land is only worth this much. And mm-hmm. they were pissed because it was like, oh, no, actually our land was worth like five <laughs> times how much we actually reported it as being. Right. But, you know, if they were, if that's why, then let me play my yeah, little yeah, violin. Yeah. Well, the smallest violin. <laughs> the smallest mm-hmm. violin for the uh, <laughs> landed elite in Guatemala. So I kind of mentioned this, but the Supreme Court voted temporarily to halt Decree 900 and basically review the expropriations by the courts. But those judges were eventually impeached by a vote of 41 to 9, mm. and the expropriations resumed. Okay, so let's just do a little bit of a quick assessment of Decree 900 and the agrarian reform up to up until about 1954. So these are just some stats. 1.4 million acres of land were expropriated. That's roughly a fourth of all arable land in Guatemala. Those who lost land owned huge quantities of it and were largely absentee landowners. And Lajesis kind of mentions this, that you have to weigh the the peasant violence in this sort of uh, particular development against the historical violence of the system. And I think this is a really, really key point, is that even if you acknowledge the mistakes that did happen and the violence that did occur, which is important, you know, you shouldn't shy away from that. It is also important to, again, contextualize that in this huge history of violence and exploitation systemically on those very same peasants. And to me, I think it's just a really key um, analytical point to have anytime you're looking at particular sort of revolutionary developments in a particular country like this. And overall, roughly 138,000 families received land from the expropriations. Uh, The provision of credit to purchase and develop land um, was a crucial part of agrarian reform, and and it also extended credit massively for land. There was some isolated cases of abuse of that credit system, but by and large, Lajesa says it was mostly, you know, very responsibly used and it was all used for its intended purpose. I guess it's not super surprising that one of the things that Lajesa is sort of speaking to preemptively is that idea of like, oh, if you just extend credit and like benefits mm. to people across the society, it's going to be abused. And he's yeah. like, yeah, no, not really. Mm. I mean, it was largely used responsibly for what it was intended yeah. for. Um, it did not lead to a decline in agricultural progression as predicted by the U.S., and its detractors, and was primarily political in its impact. So again, it's agrarian reform, mm. but I think it intended what Arbenz wanted it to do, which was essentially to shift political relations in the country. They didn't collectivize land as they did in Cuba against the wishes of the rural population. So I think this is an interesting nuance that Lajesis talks about is that they also knew that if they collectivized the land totally, instead of like distributing it to sort of individual families, they risked sort of, again, a lot of this backfiring or, or the collectivization process also kind of exploiting and like not necessarily being in the peasants interest of what they actually wanted so they tried to thread the needle between those two i think in an interesting way when we talk about the agricultural progression um a lot of these do we does he talk about what these like smaller farms end up becoming are they mostly coffee are they like do you know what what type of agriculture do these uh do they do from what I remember, I don't think they became coffee okay. or like like banana plantations necessarily yeah. because I think a lot of that was still organized in larger, more like corporate okay. organized farms. I think a lot of it might have been just like personal subsistence. subsistence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a, that a great question. Another thing, and there was an auxiliary measure measure in 1954 that it was also going to include a literacy campaign in rural areas. Again, not surprising, a lot of times land reform also necessitates a sort of literacy campaign to go along with it. There's another interesting way that um, the effect of Decree 900 is kind of described. So this is Lehesis on page 161. Lehesis says, change was stirring in the countryside. In a study conducted in the summer of 1954 among peasants jailed after the overthrow of our Benz, Richard Adams noted, and this is Adams, I'm saying an awakening of profound import did take place for many, but it was not what usually has come under the rubric of, quote, ideological. It could be better called a, quote, sociological awakening, unquote, for it amounted to a realization that certain of the previously accepted roles and statuses within the social system were no longer bounded by the same rules. 
and that new channels were suddenly opened for the expression and of satisfaction of needs. The heretofore established series of relationships between political leader and countrymen, between employer and laborer, between Indian and Landino, were not suddenly changed, but it abruptly became possible to introduce some change into them. So I thought that was a really important kind of way that, again, talking about the political and sociological effects, it doesn't necessarily overturn everything, but it does allow for change and flexibility to be more possible than it was previously. And I'll just kind of tag this on as well. The actual system of compensation for landowners, um, Lajesa says, was actually similar to the U.S. agrarian reform in Japan and Formosa. And I'm wondering, is this a thing that you were... Yeah, I was going to say, is this our official RL position? Call it Formosa. Hold on, what? Are we referring to it as Formosa for Red Library? Why, what should it be? Taiwan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, Formosa is Taiwan. Yeah, yeah, so. Interesting, okay. So when did the change? I don't remember exactly when it happened, but I think a lot of people that were like, I think it was kind of like a political thing. All the people that didn't like China would always call it Formosa and shit like that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so. I think it's just like historically it's just like an older term for it. Yeah, but for like, sure. Then I think it got like politicized later and stuff. So, so what do you think our official sh- position should be? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was just yeah. It was just like a yeah, just like an older older term for the island. So I just didn't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> no, actually it wasn't. I kind of pulled that right out of Blahesis, but yeah. that's really interesting because I think you know a lot more of that history than mm-hmm. I do. So it was politicized later on as a way to like basically kind of talk about like uh, relations I, to the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, I was like, so, well, I actually don't, like, I don't remember all the details about it, so that's why I was kind of a little <laughs> bit hesitant. To, uh, <laughs> well, you open the can of worms now, my friend. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't want to speak on it, but I just know that it's, yeah. It's like, it used to be called Formosa, and then when uh, Chiang Kai-shek evacuated to the island and stuff, and it was, like, renamed to Taiwan and stuff, so. You know, I didn't know, I knew that they renamed it, but I mm-hmm. actually did not know that its initial name was Formosa, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. interesting. We can cut this all. I just, yeah. I'm keeping no way. <laughs> we are keeping this. L- let's, let's, uh, let's just defer this to a later date to, to decide what our official line is on Taiwan versus Formosa. I guess that last I mean, point, there's some people that would just say we should just call it China, right? <laughs> well, that's true. So we have three possible options yeah, so we we'll, most of the time on China. <laughs> we'll debate it on the discord we'll have a democratically centrally decided position on what our line is going to be i guess the la- the reason i wanted to mention that line i'm glad you brought that up though that was fascinating is that the the compensation for landowners again through decree 900 the point is just to say it really wasn't different than what the u.s had done in mm, japan anyway right, so yeah. again it's like this isn't the most radical thing in the world because it's again not that different from the u.s's own policy mm. also there was a public works program as part of decree 900 and lahesis basically says that it sought to break the power of the foreign enclave that challenged guatemalan sovereignty through competition with u.s and calls for foreign expertise but not capital so again the idea is, is like they're trying to develop without reliance on foreign capital but they are trying to rely on expertise and technical knowledge from foreign places. So again, they're trying to like thread the needle and not piss off the U.S. too much, I think, in all of this. Let's re-enter, again, I just want to say the uh, diabolical global spanning squid that is the United Fruit <laughs> Company. Um, that's not a very strength-based perspective on the UFCO. <laughs> Through all this, maybe not surprising, UFCO becomes incredibly concerned, is obviously like complaining. They're, they're just really, again, very terrified of these reforms and how it's going to impact, you know, their own control over the country. But Glahesis says it's kind of interesting because 1953, despite the agrarian reform, was basically the year of high, the highest banana production in Guatemala's history. Again, I think he sees this as kind of part of why you can't necessarily attribute everything that's going to happen in Guatemala to the UFCO the way that Stephen Kinzer does in Bitter Fruit, like we talked about, mm-hmm. because he basically sees that, in a sense, like UFCO was doing fine, and the U.S. wasn't necessarily reacting increasingly just to whatever the UFCO wanted, unlike they were, I think, in the late 40s under Arevalo. Mm. So he kind of sees this as like a a divergent point whenever U.S. state policy interests and anti-communist hysteria are going to become a bigger deciding factor. And whenever capital flight did occur from Decree 900 was basically still offset by those coffee prices, ma- uh, maintaining a high level of stability. I mean, there were some some weaknesses to Decree 900. So uh, Arbenz's focus on rural and public works definitely took the focus away from the needs of the urban population. So I think this is an interesting contrast because if you remember under Arevalo's reforms, it really focused on kind of middle class uh, you know, sort of political elites from his own 
neighborhood and kind of his own background, Arben seems to go the very opposite way. And so even though a lot of the rural population was left out of Arevalo's reforms, Arben seems to also leave out a lot of the urban populations in his reforms as a sort of, I think, counteracting force to what Arevalo was doing. Hmm. But overall, Guatemala had a healthy state with a strong economy, and it, and it was matched by improvements in the political realm. Arben's administration was popular, and they had a very strong coalition. And the opposition, the conservatives, even the liberals, were in disarray after he took office and sort of how successful all this was. Okay, let's briefly go over, we're going to call it, well, this chapter is called Chapter 9, The Revolutionary Forces. So this is going to give us a kind of overview of the radical, more revolutionary elements in Guatemala that are going to be in place whenever the overthrow happens. Okay. This starts as early as December 1953. So a group of armed men stormed the RN headquarters, and that was one of the revolutionary parties. And basically, this is sort of like an opening salvo against Arbenz's administration. But up until Arbenz's overthrow, the revolutionary coalition of supporters was completely unchanged. It was very stable over these three to four years. There was the GPC, Two labor confederations, and we kind of mentioned these in part one, but that's the CGTG and the CNCG. So again, got to love left-wing politics. It's alphabet soup all mm -hmm, the way. Mm -hmm. But basically, those were unified together to form the Frente Democrático Nacional, which is the FDN. And it was essentially an, an advisory board that was actually chaired by Arbenz. So Arbenz was sitting on an advisory board that was essentially the strong link between him and the Revolutionary Coalition of Supporters. Um, the names and the numbers of the parties did change, however, throughout this time. And there were a lot of splits and tensions because it's left-wing politics, so welcome to the club. <laughs> and there was, you know, some ideological disarray and the ambitions of too many leaders that caused a lot of dissension. And the model of the revolutionary leaders, as far as they had one, was actually Mexico's ruling Partido Revolucionario Institucional, um, which is the PRI, and actually Arbenz did not support them utilizing Mexico's model at the time. So again, there's kind of, you know, still tensions between Arbenz and the Revolutionary Coalition itself. Do you know any details about that model? Like what it means? I don't actually. Like I don't okay. remember Lajesis talking very strongly about it. Um, okay. That might be something to kind of do some, some extra homework on, or maybe mm. I can put in some show links. But it mm. seems like there was a lot of tension between Mexico and their politics at the time in Guatemala, mm. and whether they should adopt like an, a model from another country to mm. work for Guatemala, I think. Okay. Um, again, but I'll try to do some extra research and, and put in some extra links for people to check that out. And a lot of revolutionary leaders were actually pretty soft compared to remarkably and not corrupt PGT. So again, a mm. lot of these revolutionary parties were pretty corrupt and weren't necessarily the most strong in their convictions. So Lajesis basically says that the PGT were actually very notable in their integrity and their, their lack of penchant for soft desk jobs and perks. So one of the things I have to say I came away thinking about the PGT and like Fortunia is that they were truly committed to a communist vision for Guatemala and they didn't seem to really stray from that or become you know sort of soft or betray their morals or their principles in this whole process even though they're the ones who again like are closest to our bends and actually have a huge amount of power and influence in the country and a lot of the other revolutionary leaders Lajesis basically says they were not hardy revolutionary leaders and they were increasingly more weak and supported our bends still but they had a lot of misgivings for it and I guess he sees that this was kind of made up for a lot of this like kind of weakened commitment to a larger revolutionary vision it was made up for with a fierce nationalism that really blossomed during Arevalo's period. And one of the mistakes here is they didn't believe that the U.S. would overthrow Guatemala's government. And that was actually, um, you know, kind of a weakness. And I mean, I think Glehesis calls it, you know, kind of a naivete mm. or definitely an illusion that was shared by the PGT and Arbenz at the same time. So again, despite how radical all this was, they really did think that the U.S. would not directly intervene as, as radically as they did. Do you think that they thought that the U.S acts more rationally than it actually does or what do you do you think that they maybe they thought that the u.s just didn't care about guatemalan politics or my impression from lajesis and some of the other sources i've read is that i think it has to do with the the history of arevalo right and how truman you know, definitely had some concerns about a communist influence in Guatemala, but they never seemed to act on it. They seemed mm -hmm. to like really keep a certain level of distance. And I think it was, I think the impression was like the U.S. doesn't really care enough to, to risk their image on the global stage, like, you know, maybe troops, maybe, you know, actually getting invested enough to overthrow. Mm -hmm. I think that they underestimated the power of anti-communist hysterian ideology that was going to come to dominate the U.S. in this period. And I think it really was a, a pretty serious error that they made, and it caused them to pretty drastically underestimate the U.S.'s commitment to 
intervening in other foreign countries, especially under the influence of the Dulles brothers in the U.S. and how, you know, sort of rabid and messianic they were in their vision yeah. of what the U.S. was supposed to be. That's why we're going to do that book on the Dallas Brothers at some uh, point. Yeah, I, we I need just, to. I just want two hours of just us like shitting on the Dallas Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Some of my least favorite people in U.S. history. I would agree. Some of my least favorites. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a, a quick paragraph here. This is just a little bit about kind of the context around this particular point of the Revolutionary Party. So Dlahesa says, The combination of frustrated nationalism and a heady sense of impunity helps to explain the strident rhetoric of most revolutionary leaders. Hostility to Washington easily translated into verbal support for the Soviet Union. According to the formula enunciated by a Mexican general in the early 1920s, quote, we are Bolsheviks. I don't know what socialism is, but I am a Bolshevik. Like all patriotic Mexicans, the Yankees do not like the Bolsheviks. The Yankees are our enemies. Therefore, the Bolsheviks must be our friends and we must be their friends. We are Bolsheviks, unquote. Radical rhetoric also polished the tarnished revolutionary credentials of its authors. Above all, it might please our Benz, whose patronage, they all courted. So I thought that was a pretty fucking scathing and damning kind of analysis of exactly how the revolutionary parties were, again, kind of relying on this nationalism. And in some ways, it's like they saw their own nationalism as something that kind of almost like inherently tied them to this sort of like Bolshevik vision, um, which again, was kind of a, was eventually going to be one of the main things that scared the hell out of the US and, and you know, definitely led to them deciding to intervene as radically as they did. You know, this question of how did Arbenz and Guatemala relate to the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union, I think is a really important one because this, I think, has a pretty big impact on how we look back in history and interpret exactly what was the ideological commitments of Arbenz. Dlahesis kind of mentions that Arbenz and the PGT were definitely very sympathetic, and it was much more clear with their sympathy for Czechoslovakia, for Korea, and for USSR. He says that nationalism and the desire to see the world inspired many young revolutionary leaders to attend international events in Eastern and Western Europe with a pro-Soviet bent which alarmed U.S. officials. So I think his understanding is that they weren't necessarily Stalinist, you know, per se, but you know, they have this chance to see the world to become much more global and, and they have like an internationalist vision. And because they're even participating in these larger internationalist events that are like definitely much more sympathetic and open, to Soviet influence, again, this is kind of more and more evidence this building for the U.S. that communists are in control of Guatemala. So this is what, in the 50s? Mm-hmm, like, I think like 50, 52, 53. 52? Okay. So if they were going to Korea, this would still have been while well, the Korean War is going on, right? I believe so, or at least they were going to uh, like places where maybe like officials from Korea uh, were right, also right, going right. to, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, gotcha. So there's a really defining moment here that was, again, going to be one of the main sort of pieces of evidence the U.S. would use to say that, like, you know, essentially communists have taken over Guatemala. The Soviet beachhead is now established and that they're going to invade the U.S. kind mm. of in straight up mm. Red Dawn right. rhetoric fashion. <laughs> On March 12th, 1953, 30 Congress deputies introduce a resolution asking for a one minute silence in honor of Stalin's death. This is going to have a huge just unbelievable impact on, again, like the kind of way that Guatemala is perceived. There's a big question of like how to interpret this. Like, was this actually like Arbenz declaring like his allegiance to Stalin and the sort of the importance that the Soviet Union had as if they were like allied with Guatemala in some like totally coherent ideological block? And I think Glehesis is actually pretty critical of this and doesn't think that this is actually what was going on at all. He actually saw it as a desire to slap the U.S. in the face. And there was actually a fear of offending our Benz by not doing this that led to an overwhelming passing of resolution and basically led to an intensification of fear of the U.S. actually sort of, you know, of what was actually going on. But again, it was kind of more of like a nationalist kind of thing. Again, we've talked about this quite heavily on the show that nationalists sort of influenced and kind of inspired pushback on the U.S., kind of would lead people to be like more sympathetic to the US, the Soviet Union, but not necessarily because, again, they were like all a bunch of Stalinists or whatever. It, it was a way that, you know, the enemy of, of my enemy is my friend, or at least like we're going to be more sympathetic to them because they aren't the people who are directly oppressing our country. But I think overall, so, it's just the idea that it's kind of this much more nuanced take that either he was a Stalinist or like some hardcore communist, or he was some person who was just like duped by the Communist Party. The communists in Guatemala were again, incredibly influential, especially considering their size and their numbers. And a lot of this, though, was like a genuine commitment by Arben. So again, we're trying to thread the needle between these typical ways that this history is really, really mm -hmm. simplified into one or the other. 
We might be getting to it, so I don't I don't want to jump ahead if we mm-hmm. do. But I was curious, I mean, between the stuff that we're talking about and the agrarian reforms um, from the last chapter, what is the U.S. response like to these things? Like, what what is happening um, in the relation between, yeah, the U.S. and Guatemala? I think a lot of this is we're going to start to see, like, increasing economic sanctions. Um, mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about this. A lot of this is actually going to come through the organs of media, like the way that journalism and the way that Guatemala is being covered and talked about in sort of like the U.S. like general civil and cultural sphere. And, you know, I can't help but say this, and we are going to get to this. Mm. Also, one of the most disgusting, most hated people in all of U.S. history for me is going to make an appearance, and that is Mr. Edward Bernays, Mm. nephew of Sigmund Freud, who is actually going to have a key role to play in this whole way that the U.S. is changing their perspective on this, too. Gotcha, okay. Bernays returned to New York and set up as a public relations council in a small office off Broadway. It was the first time the term had ever been used. Since the end of the 19th century, America had become a mass industrial society, with millions clustered together in the cities. Bernays was determined to find a way to manage and alter the way these new crowds thought and felt. To do this, he turned to the writings of his uncle Sigmund. While in Paris, Bernays had sent his uncle a gift of some Havana cigars. In return, Freud had sent him a copy of his general introduction to psychoanalysis. Bernays read it, and the picture of hidden irrational forces inside human beings fascinated him. He wondered whether he might make money by manipulating the unconscious. Kind of just to mention a little bit more about the outsized influence of the PGT and Fortuny. So, again, their influence is highly uh, outsized, considering that they only have four deputies in Congress at this time. They increasingly become Arbenz's main support and confidants until his overthrow. And so he's going to become more and more isolated from a lot of the other parties. But he's going to, again, like keep his commitment and confidence with the PGT kind of closest to him. And we're going to talk about this, but there's a really key moment that's going to trigger the U.S.'s actual intervention. And that's going to be the purchase of weapons by Arbenz and the Guatemalan government from Czechoslovakia. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The PGT sees themselves as part of the international communist movement, but, you know, they also maintain steady contacts only with communist parties in Mexico and Cuba. So essentially, again, they're kind of pretty limited in in how connected they are to like this international communist movement and tended to keep it much more regional, I would say. Hmm. Their actual connections to the Soviet party and Western European communist parties, incredibly weak. Again, the idea that they're part of this like Soviet beachhead being established in Guatemala was just completely off the mark. Um, the U.S.'s understanding of this, again, was more driven by anti-communist hysteria than an actual analysis of what was going on. So they actually requested the Soviet consulate to basically establish um, an embassy in Guatemala, but the USSR always declined this. They were you know, really uninterested in Guatemala in a lot of ways. And a lot of the majority of the labor unions voted with the other revolutionary parties and not the PGT. So again, you know, their influence is huge, mostly just because of how closely they were tied to Arbenz. But it isn't like they had some strong connection to the USSR or Eastern or Western Soviet bloc countries. And they certainly weren't even necessarily, they weren't the most influential in terms of the other labor unions in Guatemala. And the PGT, you know, again, this isn't, I think, super shocking considering how we know the composition of a lot of communist parties are. Uh, They're largely urban middle class intellectuals. And there was a lot of deep suspicion from a lot of the indigenous populations. And there was relentless hostility from the church on the communist party itself. So let's let's kind of focus in for just a brief moment. So why was the USSR so uninterested in Guatemala? Glehesa says that there are a number of factors about why this was. Basically, one, Stalin had an increasing mistrust of third world countries as he leads up to his death in 1953. He basically saw a lot of the military leaders in these countries, like in Central and South America, as kind of like imperialism stooges. Again, he kind of also didn't even really understand that you could have like really legitimate, radical, committed left wing military officers. And there's really kind of a focus on relations between U.S., and the Soviet Union and of developments in, in Europe and Southeast Asia in particular. So not super shocking considering the communist revolution in China happens in 1949, right before Arbenz comes into power. PGT was small, didn't have a whole lot of traditions, and it didn't have a whole lot of international contacts, despite, you know, again, them seeing themselves as part of an internationalist movement. And there was some flexibility and change after Stalin's death. But again, that's a year 
after Salon's death at Arbenz is overthrown. So it wasn't like there was a lot of time for them to really develop uh, that connection in a new way. So this is Lahesa, it's just kind of a very short paragraph on the PGT. He says, the PGT was moderate in its public statements. Although it acknowledged that its ultimate objective was the creation of a Marxist-Leninist Guatemala, it stressed that this was part of a distant prospect, kind of like what we were saying before. For the present and for a long time to come, the party's task would be to assist in the creation of a modern, capitalist, and fully independent Guatemala. No revolutionary politician could object. Lingering fears were assuaged by the comforting thought that in March 1957, Arbenz's presidency would end and the communists would lose their champion. So this is, I think, a really key aspect of Guatemalan politics that has to be grappled with is that even for a lot of people who didn't agree with Arbenz, didn't really like his sort of communist politics, didn't support the PGT, his election was going to potentially, I think, kind of end their influence. And so they kind of almost saw it as a matter of time for Arbenz to be in power and maybe didn't consider him that threatening because of that. So just a few things about the Guatemalan armed forces because it's going to be key in the overthrow. A lot of the U.S. observers saw that there were Russian sympathizers and the highest posts in the army. So communist influence in Guatemala's military was actually the like the least most influential than any other part of Guatemalan society. So again, the U.S. seeing it as being this hotbed of like Russian Soviet influence and and sort of figures again just completely you know divorced from all reality yeah. so the guatemala mi military at this time it's roughly 6200 men it's mostly um horribly equipped and untrained and there's a huge chasm in between enlisted illiterate indians and the officers themselves so again huge divisions between the actual like grunts and the and the officer corps it's the whole the whole military 6200 mm -hmm. yeah oh. yeah isn't that kind of shocking to yeah. think about Arbenz's commitment to his political beliefs basically weakened his influence in the military. You know, again, because the military is not a bunch of communists, despite what the U.S. thought. So Arbenz might have been governing the country with this communist cabinet that was really closely tied to the PGT, but the army was pretty firmly anti-communist through and through. And Arbenz, because, you know, pretty smart politician, he knows that he has to also keep his influence in the military somewhat stable to prevent him being overthrown in a coup. That he basically arranged so the army salaries grew under our bends and they got, you know, again, general increases in benefits and subsidies to their uh, military and their family members. And it also kind of helps explain why they accepted um, Decree 900's prov provisions overall. And, and also, at the same time, he allowed them to keep the monopoly on weapons. And the absence of communist influence in the military that was kind of being pushed by Arbenz is part of the trade-off. So again, they support Decree 900. They get to keep the guns and basically don't have to worry about an explicit communist influence being imposed on the military from Arbenz in office. A lot of the younger officers were influenced by nationalism, but only as long as U.S. anger did not threaten them. And that's going to be a key ideological commitment as we get into 1954. But overall, the absence of communist sympathizers in the armed forces was of paramount importance for basically assessing the prospect of communism in Guatemala as a whole. And Lajesa says that even if Arbenz was not overthrown, PGT influence would have been limited due to lack of sympathy in the armed forces. So again, the idea of like the army being this hotbed of communist activity and the influence of communism on the military, again, just completely divorced from all reality. And we kind of mentioned this, but Arbenz's term was scheduled to end in 1957, and the Constitution allowed for no second term. So again, it's kind of a matter of time before Arbenz is out of office, no matter what. And the PGT, their best hope would be that Arbenz's successor would just not be hostile to other parties. So they know that it's pretty limited, this influence that they're going to have. Moving right along, we're going to look at, I think, a topic probably of great interest to both of us. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the role of the church mm -hmm. in Guatemala through all of this and their opposition to Arbenz. So we kind of mentioned how in 1953, there was kind of this first salvo against Arbenz's presidency. Well, in March, there were 100 rebels that stormed the town of Salama and basically they had to be put down by the military. A lot of the opposition to Arbenz at this time was basically, the way that he describes it is that there was sort of like the Christian opposition, there was the radical fringe, and their main motivation was what he calls the implacable defense of privilege. So this is a, a brief paragraph that Lehesis has on the opposition. He says, waving the banner of anti-communism, these men engaged in a relentless campaign of opposition. Assisted by the country's new major newspapers and radio stations, they sought to raise the specter of Armageddon among the people largely lacking political sophistication. Posing as champions of a Catholic faith threatened by red hordes, they strove to inflame religious passions and they received the full backing of the church. 
I'm curious, is this much of a surprise to you considering what you know of the, the church's sort of political stances around this time? No, sadly, it is not a surprise. <laughs> yeah, maybe one of the least surprising mm. things I can imagine. So as early as 1950, Archbishop Rossell y Arellano believes that Arbenz is going to purge the communistas due to class background and marriage. So again, even the church, the main figure in the Guatemalan church, predicted that he was, again, going to be much more sympathetic to the church, to conservative forces, to the landed elite, to the class elites, because of his background. Again, huge mistake that is made about Arbenz. So kind of like Lehesis' quote mentioned, the church utilized a lot of major newspapers and radio stations to speak out against the government. They attack Decree 900 and the, and the agrarian reform. And they sort of like are influenced and are also influencing a lot of peasant skepticism of the reforms as well. A lot of foreign priests in Guatemala begin to vehemently speak out against the government and Decree 900 and, and directly intervene in Guatemala's affairs. So I think we've talked about this maybe in the El Salvador episode mm -hmm. how whenever we think about like foreign intervention the church was directly for intervening using foreign priests to basically go into guatemala and try to upset the political mm -hmm. developments in the country well when we end up doing the episode on chile there's going to be like i think an interesting kind of history there with uh, the church as well i know so. i cannot wait to cover that stuff so, yeah. i think it's so fascinating and what's interesting is despite outcries and opposition by the church and landed elites against everything to decree 900 press freedom in guatemala again kind of remains remarkably strong and even unsympathetic to U.S. journalists commenting on it. So again, kind of seem to really, again, not kind of buckle and, and really try to keep a lot of political freedoms and freedom of the press open despite like the radical opposition to it. But a lot of the rural masses generally back the government and decree 900 despite the churches trying to influence them. So a lot of the scions of upper class, a lot of scions of the upper classes were basically forced to seek foreign patrons to support opposition to Arbenz because they actually had such a strong support in the rural areas and in, you know, a lot of the radical parties and labor unions. And, you know, no surprise, the U.S. embassies were waiting and willing and even established connections with Idigoras, who is someone we're going to talk about a little bit, even approaching the U.S. for backing and support by fabricating a story that Arevalo was a communist. So even as early as like 1949, people were approaching the U.S. basically saying, hey, these guys are a bunch of commies, like back me while I overthrow them. And the U.S. was like very sympathetic to this, even if they weren't essentially committed enough to going through with a plot at that time. But after Decree 900, the U.S. begins to hear anyone who's coming to them with, you know, some plot to overthrow Arbenz's government in Guatemala. And they're increasingly concerned about a communist influence. But again, they're not quite ready to back a coup just yet. That's not going to come for a few more years. But this is where we have to sort of touch base on someone we mentioned in part one, and that's Colonel Castillo Armas. Armas basically planned to return to Guatemala in 1952 through El Salvador, where his plan was the military would rise in his defense and begin a large-scale uprising. Um, but again, this was like con constantly postponed for all sorts of like weird reasons of like chance, some of like bureaucratic necessity. Some people thought Armas was just like completely deranged and this would like never work. But this plot is going to actually be the thing that comes true and comes to pass in 1954. Armas basically re-enters the country, and the expectation was that the military and the armed forces and people not sympathetic to Arbenz would rise to overthrow him. And once Eisenhower comes into power and the influence of the Dulles brothers on Eisenhower and Eisenhower's own political commitments and his own views of like anti-communist, I guess his own commitment to anti-communism, which I think is sometimes underplayed. Some people think it's just the Dulles brothers who are influencing him, but from my understanding, Eisenhower was also like pretty committed to an anti-communist sort of approach to U.S. foreign policy. Essentially, once Eisenhower comes into power, that's whenever U.S. actually being involved in a coup and an overthrow becomes an explicit project that they start to move forward on. So by mid-1953, exiles in Honduras basically acknowledge that Armas is their leader. And they're protected by Colonel Somoza, and they have the favor of Archbishop Russell y Arellano. So again, this is where these forces start to coalesce and the U.S. is directly going to start supporting them. So let's move on to chapter 11 and we're going to sort of try to move quickly up to the events that actually lead to 1954. In 1951, Guatemala is surrounded by rising dictatorships. You have Trujillo in the, in the Dominican Republic. You have Somoza in Nicaragua. You have Jimenez in Venezuela. You have Batista in Cuba. So again, 
Guatemala completely surrounded by a lot of these right-wing military dictators. So the UFCO's plantations in Honduras were basically very extensive, and they had actually the former Secretary of War and a UFCO lawyer, Juan Manuel Galvez, was in charge. So again, direct link between like the military and the U.S. corporate influence in the area. I will say just one one kind of like a precedent to arm us actually uh, engaging in the coup. Blahesis talks about what was called Operation Fortune, and it was essentially again, like an overthrow by Somoza's protege. So Armas was actually a protege of Somoza, again, kind of an important link there, which I guess Truman knew about this, uh, but withheld the knowledge from Dean Acheson, who was head of the State Department at the time. But eventually Acheson learns of the plot while it's en route. So essentially they were sending ships with weapons and they were basically going to like be utilized by the by the golpistas, like by Armas and stuff. So, and essentially Acheson finds out about this. They redirect the ship to Panama and Operation Fortune never really goes down. But again, it's kind of a way that like, it never really happened, but these these sort of like abortive attempts at actually overthrowing Guatemala and Arevalo and, and Arbenz, this was sort of in the works for years. Yeah, there's something like that that happens in, in Chile as well. Yeah, like an initial initial plan mm-hmm. that then is like halfway put into the place and then it gets canceled and then they like later on essentially do do more. So. Yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, based on kind of what you know about the history, mm. my impression is that there's a pretty standard playbook that mm. the CIA and the State Department and stuff are starting to build around this time. And I think it's almost like a similar playbook we see now whenever you see like that weird shit mm. of uh, what were they called, like Silver Corp or whatever yeah, in, yeah. in Venezuela. It seems like they still operate on a lot of the same plays. It's, yeah, when we when we get into one of the books that I wanted to use on that episode, I think really uh, did a good job of detailing like exactly this, like the levers that the U.S. was able to kind of pull behind the scenes to, you know, to kind of put the pressure uh, and then I thought it was like really interesting to to kind of see how they did it. So yeah, and I think that'll probably be the next episodes in this series as we're going to start doing the the work on Chile, which will probably be pretty extensive. I think. Cool. So there is one interesting thing about Operation Fortune that's a good precedent to to understand for what's going to happen with Arbenz's overthrow. So part of the plan was basically to actually let me step back on that. So Glahesis kind of mentions a couple of things that are going to be used to successfully overthrow Arbenz, but basically weren't really part of this initial plan in Operation Fortune. So he basically says that it, it kind of would have been suicide due to the strength of Arbenz and the political sort of uh, coalition that they had at the time, and that there was a lack of psychological warfare against Guatemala's mil- military. So that would become part and a key part of what would happen in 1954 that would actually uh, uh, lead to a successful overthrow of Arbenz was this way that psychological warfare and propaganda was going to be directed at the military itself in Guatemala. And he kind of just mentions here that Acheson's uh, opposition to Operation Fortune was likely because he was convinced it would fail and not because he was like inherently opposed Mm. to intervening in Guatemala. It was really he just didn't think it would be successful. It wasn't a good plan. And, And basically... I think Lahesa says that it's a little bit of a speculation, but more than likely what happened is that Atchison knew it would fail and convinced Truman to call it off. Um, again, but not because they were fundamentally opposed to intervening. They just knew it wasn't a good plan. So I want to just kind of read briefly here about um, the U.S. journalist sort of approach and, and kind of the way that they were talking about Guatemala and the opposition. This is Lahesa's talking about a series that ran in the New York Herald Tribune. Again, just kind of the way that U.S. journalism was starting to, to increase this fear that there was a communist sort of takeover and in in a U.S. Or, or a Soviet Union beachhead in Guatemala had been established. He says, a series by Daniel James and the New York Herald Tribune contributed the alarming information that Guatemala was but five hours from New Orleans. This is straight up things that are said in Red Dawn. <laughs> James agreed that the communists did not control Guatemala, interestingly enough, but he was disturbed by their growing influence. After comparing the tactics of the PGT with those of Mao Zedong and the Yenan Wei, which is basically communist wolves in agrarian reformers' clothing, he ended by stating ominously that Guatemala had recently quit the Odeca, which I think is a larger, like, sort of like international like conglomeration, because it objected to El Salvador's proposed united front against communism. So again, these like weird circumstantial evidences and and sort of like weird interpretive leaps to basically say, uh oh, like Guatemala is exactly like Mao and the communist revolution. This is the things, this is how this is being talked about. So we kind of mentioned this a little bit, but Eisenhower, you know, comes into his presidency in 1952. John Foster Dulles is the Secretary of State. Yeah, you can't see it where we're giving the RMR, like, you know, our grills are flashing and we're flipping off John Foster Dulles' corpse. 
Um, so again, you know, Eisenhower comes into power on the heels of the Red Scare, McCarthyism, the Korean War. So again, Lahesis kind of says that Eisenhower was not just beholden to John Foster Dulles, but he also followed a containment policy, you know, similar to Truman, and listed Arbenz's overthrow as one of his proudest accomplishments in his memoirs. Yeah. So the idea that Eisenhower was like mm -hmm. not aware of this, or it was just John Foster Dulles operating behind the scenes, again, in Eisenhower's own memoirs, he describes Arbenz's overthrow as one of his best moments. Damn. I did not know that. Yeah, I know. I found that pretty shocking too. Mm. I don't know. I'm, do you ever have much of an opinion on Eisenhower? Going no, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, he always seemed like, as a politician, very bland. Not big energy from Eisenhower. You yeah, get a lot of yeah, big energy. no. But yeah, no, I guess I just, I guess maybe that was the, maybe the vision that he wanted to portray was that he was just generally uninterested in a lot of this. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of surprising to hear some of that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm assuming, you know, if he was aware of Arbenz's overthrow and cites it as one of his proudest accomplishments, you got to think that he was directly, heavily involved, even mm -hmm. if it wasn't stated or it wasn't on paper, in Mosaddegh's overthrow in Iran, too, with Operation Ajax. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, because I feel like that's, at least uh, maybe that's been changed now, or at least it used to be the the, the messaging, be, or the history behind Ajax was kind of like, you know, he was basically just convinced to do it by the people underneath him and mm -hmm. he really wasn't that interested but you know when it was when he's convinced about it being like anti-communist then he kind of went along with it but yeah wasn't like super into it but i don't know that's probably not the case i mean at least from lahesis's point of view i think mm -hmm. it would cause me to because i've heard that story yeah. too about ajax and so part of me has to go back and say i don't know i mean maybe that is you know, not very accurate. Maybe mm -hmm. he was definitely like, even if it was more behind the scenes and wasn't clearly stated to protect his own, you know, sort of status as a president. I mean, maybe he was definitely like a lot more involved in this than than I was previously right, aware of. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the the key players on the U.S. side in the overthrow of Arbenz. So we have John Foster Dulles. Uh, we have Alan Dulles as the head of the CIA. So John Foster's brother, mm -hmm. also one of the most despicable people that has ever uh, walked the planet, mm -hmm. and especially in U.S. politics, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And General Bedell Smith. So John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower, you know, initially had lost over Latin America and were not very familiar with its historical, you know, um, political and economic context and trends. So again, they're not really aware or really understand anything about the region and its history. I mean, no shock there. So interesting, um, General Bedell Smith, Bedell Smith, I don't know, who cares? Fucking yeah, he's dead. Yeah. Also, he was part of Arbenz's overthrow, so I have no respect yeah. for how to pronounce his name. <laughs> uh, so actually, Smith had overseen Operation Fortune, which we had just mentioned, and he was actually mm -hmm. a big backer of the attempted overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, like we just talked about, mm -hmm. and he was the backer of Kermit Roosevelt from the State Department. Kermit Roosevelt was the person who was sent to Iran to yeah. basically engineer Mossadegh overthrow for the CIA. So basically, as soon as Eisenhower is inaugurated, the CIA starts to plan Operation Ajax. And basically, that's carried out in 1953, the year before Arbenz is overthrown. So essentially, their success in, o in Ajax is part of what gave them the sort of hubris and, and kind of like uh, the confidence to feel like, well, we can just do whatever we want now. Yeah, I mean, I know that they were pretty shocked by how little money they had to spend in Ajax to get to successfully overthrow that so I feel you remember like, what it was wasn't it like a briefcase of like a million dollars or something like I that. i thought it was less than that it but might I, have been I, I could be I, I yeah i remember looking at the figure and it being it being very small yeah i don't remember it off the top of my head well one of these days we are going to do an episode on operation ajax and mosaddegh i feel like that needs mm -hmm. to happen at some point yeah so the council on foreign relation also was urging eisenhower to quote be bold unquote and they were strongly pushing that guatemala was communist with soviet backing so again this isn't just eisenhower this is also a larger international body of the council on foreign relations i also have to say i mean this is like big conspiracy theory hours yeah. because you know a lot of right-wing libertarians will talk about the council on foreign relations and the trilateral commission and all this other stuff you know, I don't know about you, but I've definitely spent my time in right-wing conspiracy theory land. And uh -huh. one of the things that I think is really important is just to kind of, you know, know that, you know, despite all the, like, just complete, like, nonsensical babbling by right-wing, you know, <laughs> conspiracy theorists, you know, institutions like the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, like, do exist. Mm. They have a very clear history you can track, and they have enormous influence on politics across the globe. Yeah. I can't believe we just talked about CFR on Red Live. I feel like I've been waiting for that to happen for a long time. <laughs> Surprised it's taken this long to be. I, actually, that's actually, true. Actually, wait, did we did we talk? We well, no, we mentioned it on the um, on the S Central American Guerrilla Wars. Did we? I thought so. Oh well, we probably should have if we didn't. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. Okay, I'm gonna trust you. I don't trust my own memory. 
This is all simulation as far as because I remember. Because I remember, to, I remember to, even before the episode asking you, I was like, wait, is this, is this the same one as all the conspiracy theories and shit like that that people talk about? No, yeah, so, maybe you did. I don't think it was on the episode. Maybe that's what maybe it was. Maybe it was an offline discussion. Pre, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Super episode. secret classified. Exactly, yeah. We don't want to get on the CFR's radar <laughs> by mentioning them on the show disparagingly. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's keep going. We're almost we're almost through here. We're kind of coming up to 1954. Anti-communist hysteria and imperial hubris basically blinded them. So let's talk about the actual operation to overthrow Arbenz itself. So it's going to be called Operation PB Success, and it officially begins in September of 1953. Most of the CIA and the State Department completely kept in the dark on the entire operation. Got to love that uh, that whole uh, secrecy thing that the Dulles brothers were all about. So Woodward, who was, I think, like a high up like CIA official, he was basically deceived by John Foster Dulles and only found out about the plan after Arbenz was overthrown. So again, they weren't even talking to most people in the CIA about this was very compartmentalized. Hmm. The planning focused on military opposition to overthrow Arbenz, and Operation PB success was based on one fundamental premise. Only Guatemala's military could overthrow Arbenz. So they knew that they couldn't invade with a foreign, you know, expeditionary force mm-hmm, or whatever, mm-hmm. it had to come internally from Guatemala. And so that's why it's going to be focused on propagandizing and trying to turn the military against Arbenz. Psychological warfare was used to convince them that their well-being and security were at risk with Arbenz in power in the agrarian reforms, along with a wave of international sanctions, you know, basically were tactics. So the idea was is that they scared the hell out of the military by basically saying, if you do not overthrow Arbenz, we are going to, you know, sanction you. We are potentially going to invade the country. So they were threatening the military to get the military to to basically rise up against Arbenz mm. to protect their own interests. They also kind of used a lot of the exiles from from Arbenz. Arbenz, and the idea was to spark and trigger a fifth column in the military organized by the CIA. So that was generally the plan. And here's kind of the main, I guess, approach they were using. The idea would be that a crisis would present the military with a choice. Defeat the rebels who are invading from a foreign area. So that's actually going to be Artemis and his sort of expeditionary force, so like his sort of like band of rebels and exiles. Mm-hmm. They're going to invade from Honduras, and that the military is either going to have to defeat the rebels and face the wrath of the U.S. or turn against Arbenz and save themselves, and basically to convince the officers that the exiles were U.S. proxies whose defeat would trigger a U.S. invasion. So the idea was that they were going to put them into this horrible dilemma, basically saying, even though you're not super committed to to Arbenz, and he's actually benefited the military in a lot of ways, if you don't rise up against him, the U.S. is kind of waiting behind the rebels, Mm -hmm. you know, to to basically invade. Uh, Just one other sort of political thing here. There was, there was a communique or like a, a statement from the National Security Council that was recorded in mid-March that I thought was uh, pretty uh, pretty important. And basically, this is Lehesis. He says, President Eisenhower and Secretary Dulles wanted to protect the image of the United States abroad, particularly in Latin America. Just a few weeks before Eisenhower assumed the presidency, a CIA national intelligence estimate had stressed that Latin America was threatened by, quote, the pressure of exaggerated nationalism, unquote, and that this trend might eventually, quote, affect hemisphere solidarity and U.S. security interests, unquote. Gotta love their language. Hmm. The same morning was repeated by Alan Dulles at a February 18, 1953 meeting of the National Security Council, or the NSC, and in mid-March, NSC 144-1 stated that the United States must, have, must, quote, avoid the appearance of unilateral action, unquote, in the internal affairs of the Latin American republics. So the idea was is that they know that they have to undermine and like stop this sort of like rising nationalist and like anti-us sentiment but they have to avoid any appearance of unilaterally acting upon that so they can't actually invade or like engage in direct operations but they're going to do everything in their power to undermine this like nationalist upsurge in latin american Mm -hmm. countries there is kind of a paradox at the heart of operation pb success so they have to deny us involvement but they also have to convince Guatemala's military that the U.S. was involved and would invade if they didn't rise up against Arben. So it's kind of this weird paradoxical approach mm-hmm. that they're utilizing. And the U.S. kind of through, again, propaganda, journalism, media, news outlets, public relations from Edward Bernays with UFCO, they basically convinced the population at home that the U.S. was the victim. And that Guatemala was the aggressor. Yeah, classic U.S. stuff right there. The U.S. asked the embassy to nominate a leader against Arbenz, and they choose Armas against all other, quote, poor starters, unquote. So, again, Armas is definitely not the ideal pick to lead the the rebels invading Guatemala. But, again, amidst a, a band of Rhodes and derelicts, he was the best option that they had. The U.S. also sought a new ambassador to Guatemala, and this is going to be John Purifoy. And they picked him because of his willingness to assist 
Operation PB success. So at the beginning of this episode, we had a cold open with a clip from the great documentary when, when Mountains Tremble about Guatemala in the 80s and the 90s. So that person talking to Arbenz and Maria Arbenz, that is, I believe, John Purifoy. So that is the U.S. ambassador mm. directly talking to a president of a foreign country and threatening them directly. Interesting little uh, bit about Purifoy's credentials. He was formerly in Greece where he assisted in the defeat of the Greece communist rebels, showing up conservative government and to prevent a communist resurgence in Greece. His credentials preceded him with basically anti-communist plots and mm. uh, you know, scandalous intelligence tactics. So a couple of other measures that the U.S. were including as part of Operation PB Success, so the Council of the Organization of American States had a proposal that they were basically calling the Intervention of International Communism in the American Republic, so they were kind of garnering support there. And there was a general public denunciation campaign against Arbenz's administration. Arbenz is, you know, again, they're not, they're very politically savvy. They know that something is afoot here. So there were some key arrests of plotters attached to Animus and, and Operation PB Success that did cause, did cause some disruptions and exposure of the plan in September of 1953. You know, kind of this is all starting to ramp up. Arbenz is like increasingly in the PG tier aware that something is definitely pretty serious going to happen. I think they feel this increasing threat of the U.S. And one of the things that kind of happened in 1949 that's really important is that the U.S. actually stopped selling weapons to Guatemala and they started to attempt to frustrate other attempts to sell them weapons, uh, you know, into 1951. So they're trying to weaken Guatemala's military, their ability to defend themselves. Um, and then in 1953, under increasing pressure and fears of invasion and overthrow, Arbenz learns of the U.S. plans and basically engages in a secret and pretty desperate gamble to buy weapons from Czechoslovakia and to secretly allow the PGT to start arming workers' militias with those weapons because they know that ideally there's going to be an invasion by rebel forces and that they're probably going to get the military to try to rise up against Arbenz. So it's kind of a little too late at this point, but they are like pushing really strongly to try to get some access to weapons to arm workers' militias to protect the country. So this was actually the first time in all of 20th century history that a Soviet bloc country sent weapons to the Western Hemisphere. But a lot of these weapons were, were basically captured German arms from World War II, and they were paid for in cash immediately by Arbenz. But there's this increasing pressure, and they know that this is really desperate. This could really backfire. So if the U.S. learns of them buying these weapons, it's going to essentially solidify their suspicion that they're kind of this like Soviet beachhead in the Western Hemisphere. Fortuny is becoming increasingly marginalized in the PGT as tensions grow, and he actually resigns without telling Arbenz. I want to read really quickly something that Glehesis mentions about the rationale for distributing the arms bought from Czechoslovakia that I thought was uh, important. He says, yet Arbenz was anxious. He alternated between waves of deep pessimism and surges of optimism. His optimism, notes his wife, who was his closest confidant through those harrowing weeks, quote, was a means of self-defense. It was better to grasp at straws than to be defeated psychologically before the final battle, unquote. In fact, Arbenz lived in a private world fraught with ghosts and contradictions, and nowhere were these contradictions more apparent than in the decision to import arms from Czechoslovakia. The weapons would build the morale of an army that had long been frustrated in its desire for new material. They would also increase its capacity to defeat a U.S.-sponsored invasion of Guatemala. Yet the decision to set aside some of the weapons derived from mistrust by the very institution that would be strengthened by the remainder. In one stroke, Arbenz and the PGT were providing for a workers' militia they knew the army would never countenance, and they were giving the army weapons to crush it should it appear. And so again, this kind of decision to import these arms, again, was kind of fraught with a lot of contradictions and ended up being a pretty disastrous gamble, I think. Just a couple of other notes, uh, just to touch on the church and the archbishop at the time. Uh, the archbishop drums up support and criticism in the church. Guatemalans are training at CIA camps in Nicaragua and Honduras. And there's even a 70 abandoned Air Force base out outside of Miami that is used to train the rebels and to support the invasion. And funny little historical note here, Howard Hunt, who is later part of the Watergate break-in and scandal, was also involved in PB success. So Operation PB success was calling for 200 to 300 men to invade Guatemala. And then again, this fifth column in the army itself was going to rise up and support them and overthrow Arbenz. 
again, tragically, kind of like what we're saying. So basically, the CIA discovers the arms whenever they land in Puerto Barrios, and then Eisenhower and his advisors basically accelerate PB's success to make sure that Armas begins the invasion before they distribute the arms to the military and the workers' militias. John Foster Dulles makes a statement about expanding Soviet colonialism, as he called mm -hmm. it, and they start to resurrect the Monroe Doctrine to basically sort of ideologically support their decision. Um, and the USSR was said to be directly attacking the Monroe Doctrine by Guatemala's uh, sort of distributing of these arms. Just in terms of the, uh, the sort of role of, of media and, and sort of journalism and all of this as this is ramping up, Lajesa says other highly publicized military measures were taken rapidly. On May 23rd, the US Navy dispatched two submarines from Key West, quote, saying only that they were going south, unquote. Four days later, the Air Force sent three intercontinental bombers, B-36s, to participate in the celebrations of Nicaragua's Army Day, which coincided with Mrs. Somoza's birthday. The B-36, the New York Times stated dryly, quote, is capable of delivering the atomic bomb, unquote. As the planes flew overhead, the Nicaraguan crowds cried, long live the United States, long live Somoza. For Nicaragua, it was a singular distinction. This is the first time, the New York Times pointed out, that any of the big strategic bombers have taken part in a foreign holiday. Those who sent the planes were not thinking, however, of Mrs. Somoza's birthday. The quote-unquote goodwill mission, explained a prominent columnist, is merely a maneuver reminiscent of the 1910 muscular diplomacy celebrated by Richard Harding Davis. The bombers flew over Nicaragua. Their shadow fell on Guatemala. Mm. So to me, again... You just gotta love how they're just basically kind of low key saying, yeah, you know, we got bombers flying over. They could drop the atom bomb on Guatemala if they mm -hmm. wanted to. At the risk of just horribly being ironic and postmodern to say, <sighs> sad flex, but okay. <laughs> well, I mean, what was it? It was like around, uh, it's like a little bit before, a little bit after 2000, right? Where there was like tensions between, I think, US and China and the US uh, just uh, like surfaced like three, three missile subs like in, uh, yeah, I think Shanghai Harbor or something mm -hmm. like that. I think I remember and, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, that's um, part of the reason for the increase in the development of the Chinese Navy. It's so. almost as if like this sort of influence of the U.S. basically flexing its military might, mm -hmm. provoking people, is just systematically deleted from the historical mm -hmm. record. Yeah. So again, kind of increasing tensions and things wrapping up, uh, ramping up. The U.S. Fuhrer also provoked the strike of about 40,000 workers in Honduras at a UFCO plantation there and at Standard Fruit. And essentially, the Hondurans claim that international communism is behind the strike from the outset. Again, this is not true, but again, this sort of increasing way that all of this stuff is kind of collapsed under the signifier of like communist influence becomes more and more intense. The arms from Czechoslovakia, you know, again, they're discovered, it backfires, and again, it kind of ends up escalating U.S. aggression, and Guatemalan officers seize the arms at the pier, and Arbenz, because they're now discovered and it's no longer a secret, is forced to turn those over to the armed forces, essentially like preventing any ability to counteract those forces by distributing them to workers' militias. On May 26th, there's an unmarked C-47 that flies overhead, dropping leaflets in Guatemala City that, quote-unquote, liberation was at hand. And basically, they saw this as a rehearsal for bombing runs on Guatemala City itself. Now, the CIA was also training commandos in Nicaragua, and they actually began sabotage operations all over Guatemala. Now, Guatemala, essentially, at this point, they know what's happening, and they call for talks with the U.S. to ease tension, but Purifoy and the U.S. just completely stonewall them at this point. So again, the plan is already in motion. The U.S. effectively violates international law by quarantining Guatemala's ports and shipping with full knowledge from John Foster and Alan Dulles. And, you know, again, there's increasing suspicion by our of internal plotters of CIA, you know, sort of agents. And there's, you know, this is leading to arrests of several hundred suspects. So there were a lot of plotters, but a lot of them weren't. And there were actually about 75 people killed and hastily buried that were essentially swept up in these arrests. It's like there's this increasing tension and suspicion of, of foreign influence. But because of this, the U.S. calls Guatemala's actions the actions of a tyrannical communist minority that was maintaining itself against the will of the people. So let's move into the final stages here, and um, that'll bring us to the very tragic end of Yatabo Arbenz and the hope of uh, Marxist-Leninist Guatemala. 
So on June 17th, the official invasion by Castillo Armas begins, and then 10 days later, Arbenz resigns. And there's kind of a subsequent leftist rhetoric under the shadow of Castro. Again, this is where you start to hear this narrative that Arbenz is this bourgeois politician. He's non-revolutionary. Again, this is kind of the shadow of Cuba's influence and sort of the role of Castro and Che in this whole period. And initially, Arbenz had a lack of concern about Armas. And it was basically on the belief, and unfortunately a naive one, that the military posed no threat to him. The initial rebel force was actually smaller than what the U.S. wanted. It was about 150 rebels as opposed to two to 300. And they basically invaded with the same like sort of broken down kind of like haggard weaponry that the Guatemalan army had themselves. And essentially only in communications and air power did they actually have the advantage over the Guatemalan military. But Arbenz, you know, again, he's pretty concerned that if he arms the population against the weak rebels, he's going to provoke the military to rise up against him. So he's kind of stuck in this deadlock about trying to balance you know, the people versus the, the military's influence and, and how that's going to affect how this plays out. And he also, I think, again, kind of naively hoped that the outcry from the entire world of Latin America and across the world as a whole about U.S. interference would prevent any further invasion. But unfortunately, that was not to be the case. But this idea that there was going to be this fifth column and like sabotage by CIA trained commando units like didn't necessarily materialize or wasn't as, as impactful as everyone hoped. The rebels progressed to Guatemala City. It's pretty uneventful. A few small skirmishes here and there, but largely they just marched there straight away. Arbenz basically shifts the, the resistance to the invasion to a diplomatic battle with the U.S., uh, basically because he was pretty sure that they were going to defeat the rebel forces pretty pretty handedly. But, you know, again, so he shifts this idea of trying to diplomat diplomatically resolve the situation. But again, what he didn't anticipate is that the officers and the Guatemala military start to rebel out of fear that the U.S. Will, will intervene and turn opposition towards Arbenz. And they basically saw him as the reason for the U.S. threat. So, Again, because they already know that there's the side of hand of the U.S. that's behind Armas, they kind of blame Arbenz for invoking all of this in the first place. Kind of too little too late, but Arbenz calls to together Congress and labor unions and tries to distribute weapons on June 25th. And then after that, uh, the chief of the armed forces, Colonel Diaz, was basically picked as the leader to take over Guatemala by the U.S. And the U.S. sees Guatemala is now stable and anti-communist and pro-U.S. So I can't remember the exact date, but I think it might have been around the 21st or 22nd, I think, Audubon's resigns. You said 27th up in the notes above. Oh, so. did I pick the 27th? Yeah, you said 27th. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So again, I mean, like the U.S. kind of picks Diaz before Arbenz is even officially mm. resigned. It's like, oh, this is now the leader of Guatemala. Again, kind of similar playbook, I think. Mm. Really quick, just as we kind of come to a close, I, I want to read a section from Audubon's last speech that he gave. This is Lehesis. So on June 27, 1954, Arbenz resigns and he taped a short speech that Fortuny had prepared. It was broadcast at 9 p.m. So this is Arbenz speaking and this is Fortuny saying with a voice full of emotion, President Arbenz bade, bade farewell to the Guatemalan people and this is Arbenz himself. He says, quote, I say goodbye to you, my friends, with bitterness and pain, but firm in my convictions, unquote. He was resigning to eliminate, quote, the pretext for the invasion of our country, unquote. He had reached his decision with his eyes on the welfare of the people, and he would hand over power to his friend Carlos Enrique Diaz, quote, with the hope of saving the democratic, democratic gains of the October Revolution, a government that, although different from mine, is still inspired by our October Revolution, is preferable to 20 years of bloody tyranny under the men whom Castillo Armas has brought into the countryside, unquote. And this is Glehesis. He says, Arbenz's words, words of immense sadness and dignity, were as enigmatic as the man himself. He did not explain his decision. He remained silent about developments at the front. He made no reverence to any ultimatum from his officers, because they basically said, resign or we're going to overthrow you. Indeed, his speech included no attack on the army that had betrayed him. His criticism, and it was scathing, was reserved for Castillo Armas and the United States. I thought that was a really important thing to, to read because, you know, in some ways, at least the way that his last speech kind of goes, he understands his own resignation as a way to try to prevent further violence and prevent the overthrow of himself by Armas and trying to basically put another military officer in charge. Again, this is not going to work out. Like, they're, they're going to get overthrown anyway. But to me, I think it's really important to understand, like, he did resign in the hopes of preserving whatever gains they had made. 
with Decree 900 and everything else under his presidency. Diaz basically told Arbenz that troops would attack the capital if he didn't resign and the PGT wasn't banned. So again, that's who he turns the government over to directly from threats from Diaz himself. Um, but Arbenz appealed to the army to continue, invi uh, continue fighting the invading re rebels even after his resignation. And I think kind of on that note, I'm just going to leave with a, a few concluding notes because this uh, kind of kind of final moment in 1954 is, is the end of Arbenz and, and this sort of democratic hope and communist hope of Guatemala. I think kind of just some final statements that Lajesis makes is that the fear of communism under Arevalo was strongly influenced by the UFCO, but but fear of Arbenz was influenced little. So basically the idea is, is that under Arevalo, the UFCO and their influence has a lot more power, but under Arbenz, again, it shifts more to this anti-communist policy of, of Eisenhower and the Dulles president mm -hmm. in the U.S. Arbenz's agrarian reform is much more challenging than Arevalo's Caribbean League. And again, we kind of mentioned this, but there was a sort of like the way he describes it as a kind of induced euphoria in the CIA after Mossadegh's overthrow. And this eventually leads to the Bay of Pigs invasion too, because they essentially did not understand like what was successful about Arbenz resigning. And so he kind of sees that like part of the, the CIA's sort of um, hubris and why they engaged in the Bay of Pigs, despite how disastrous that was, is because essentially they didn't even really understand what led to Arbenz resignation in the first place. I mean, I was going to say, to be honest, like when I read about that, it was like literally just like 150 guys that like, you know, kind of precipitated the whole thing. Yep. There was part of me that was just like, oh, maybe I can sort of understand why the Bay of Pigs, like why they even tried the Bay of Pigs, because mm -hmm. it was just like, if that's all it takes to overthrow, obviously there's like a lot of, you know, like complex mechanisms going yep. on internally, and then also the threat of U.S. intervention externally. But if all you have to do is just push a handful of, of armed men into the country, and that's what happens, like it is easier to see why they thought the Bay of Pigs would work or something like that. So. Absolutely. And and Lajesis directly says that, you know, because of Arbenz and Mosaddegh's sort of overthrows, mm -hmm. it essentially blinded the U.S. to, again, why they were even successful in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it blinded them to any real need for, for policy changes in the region. So I'm going to read just here, and this is a couple of just last quotes I want to I leave uh, comrade listeners with and, and for us just to kind of start wrapping up. So this is Lajesis's I think kind of general overview or judgment of some of the strengths and weaknesses of Arbenz. He says, quote, um, Jacobo Arbenz is not one of history's giants. He made serious mistakes. He was naive. Irrespective of, of his political beliefs, he should have kept a tight rein on the administration media. The tone of DCA, other government publications, and the radio was needlessly provocative, as were actions such as the minutes of silence for Stalin. He underestimated the threat from the United States until late 1953, when the documents provided by Delgado made it irrefutable that the United States was plotting against him. Arbenz, who had renounced Arevalo's activist foreign policy, failed to grasp how completely the inter-American system was dominated by the United States, how completely Bolivar had been replaced by Monroe. He believed, tenaciously, naively, that other Latin American governments would stand up to foster Dallas at Caracas, and that was basically a kind of earlier convention where they thought that they would gain a lot of support from other Latin American countries. It did not happen. Later, he turned his hopes to the United Nations, blind to the fact that international law was as impotent to help him as it would be for the Hungarians in 1956, the Dominicans in 1965, or the Czechs in 1968. After his uh, pretty uh, scathing criticisms of his weaknesses, mm -hmm. this is Lehesis on some of his strengths. He says, Jacobo Arbenz provided Guatemala with the best government it has ever had. He embarked on the first comprehensive development plan in the history of Guatemala, whereas his predecessor had not even outlined such a plan, and he presided over the most successful agrarian reform in the history of Central America. Within 18 months, quote, the agrarian reform had reached its halfway mark, unquote. 500,000 peasants had received land without disrupting the country's economy. The Cree 900 brought more land to the poor. It brought in political freedom in the countryside. Serfs were becoming citizens. By the end of Arbenz's term, Hundreds of thousands of peasants would have been solidly established on land granted them by Decree 900. In a fundamental sense, Arbenz's successor would have inherited a Guatemala far different from that Arevalo had bequeathed to him in 1951. But the Pax Americana prevailed. Nowhere in Central America or the Caribbean has U.S. intervention been so decisive and so baneful in shaping the future of a country. To talk about the the surprise at U.S. intervention, I was curious, so were there any coups under Truman? I'm trying to think. I mean, none that I know of that were sort of uh, as direct as Mosaddegh and Arbenz. I mean, from okay. my understanding, you know, if we think about our Central America, like the Guerrilla Wars episode mm -hmm. on Landau's book, mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think that what typically happened from what I remember, especially in like Nicaragua, is like they just directly sent foreign troops into the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for, you know, just decades upon decades. But the idea that they would actually overthrow a foreign government, um, as far as I know, at least with this sort of like state backing the direct line of this these plans leading up to mm. the presidency, the first one I'm really aware of is is with Mosaddegh, but Again, I think this is why we're going to need to do some serious work in future episodes on this. Mm. I think we also have to understand the way that anti-communist policy and like anti-communist sorts of approaches that the U.S. took in Greece during the Greek Civil War, I think, is also kind of laying a foundation for a lot of this mm. as it plays out in terms of Central and South America, too. So my understanding of the history is that a lot of this is connected. And I don't think there was any so much like a like a plot, but I do think that the U.S. Operation Gladio, Gladio yeah. like things in Greece, like they were directly, you know, backing even fascist groups to, mm -hmm. you know, present a counterforce to communist influence. I mean, it might just come down to like, were there official like plots and overthrows? Not so much. Were they backing? just straight up fascist yeah, forces okay. to fight communists yes they absolutely mm. were yeah i mean i, I was just asking because it's I, I do think before this in ajax um it's like hard to like maybe it's they didn't have a lot of evidence of the u.s doing this like in the past and so maybe it was easier to think that it wouldn't when they wouldn't do anything or something yeah so, i don't know i'm gonna read the last quote and then we can just do uh maybe some dabble assessment and a final yeah. wrap up sounds good so this is the very last uh, paragraph in the conclusion from Blahesis, and to me, again, kind of drives the point home and connects up the history, again, not just from Arbenz's overthrow, but how this would influence Guatemala for the next, you know, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. He says, perhaps someday the process that the United States crushed in 1954 will resume. Perhaps someday the social reforms that the upper class and the military now oppose will become possible, and the culture of fear will again loosen its grip over the land of Guatemala. At present, there is the reality a reality that was expressed in the 1988 pastoral of the Guatemalan bishops. Quote, the cry for land is, without any doubt, the loudest, the most dramatic, and the most desperate sound in Guatemala. The hunger for land is the root of the injustice of our society, unquote. The bishops paid homage to, their, to the man their predecessors had reviled. Arbenz's agrarian reform program, they asserted, was, quote, the only serious attempt to reform this situation of profound injustice, unquote. Since 1954, at least 100,000 Guatemalans have been killed and over 40,000 have disappeared to preserve the fruits of Castillo Armas's victory. And that is how Lajesis leaves us with shattered hope on the Guatemalan revolution mm -hmm. from 1944 to 1954. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not, you know, again, I know we kind of approach this, this whole topic. And, and for me, you know, like we mentioned with, what feels like a, an incredible gravity and seriousness to the material. Mm -hmm. As far as I, I've been able to understand the history, the impact of, of Arbenz's overthrow, it wasn't even until May 2013 that someone, you know, basically um, Guatemalan general politician who overthrew, you know, the government in 1982, um, Rios Montt, was one of the people who was responsible for all these like mass murders, right wing death squads you know, disappearances. And it wasn't even until 2013 that he was even convicted of that and was tried for war crimes. Um, and I'm actually just reading now that it was on May 20th of, 19, of 2013 that the Constitutional Court of Guatemala overturned his conviction. You know, again, I mean, the, the sort of legacy of this, the impact of, of Arbenz's overthrow, again, just has, you know, reverberations, violent, horrible reverberations that still seem to be happening in Guatemala as, as, as much as I'm aware of it, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to learn still about what's happening as much as I can. So, CC Don, I feel like this episode is kind of a callback to, to Radio War Nerd and maybe in true Radio War Nerd fashion, we're not, we're going to end on a note of pessimism and mm -hmm. sort of tragedy and sadness. Yeah, I don't know if there's much else to say besides that, so... Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, it's just kind of important to make sure that this history is out there and to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe correct some of the, the simplified interpretations and, and historical understandings of what Arbenz was doing, like who yeah. he was as a person. Because I guess, you know, reading this, I just can't help but deeply inspired by him and the, the sort of like kind of the, the incredible radicality of his project. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, I found the, the land reform to be very impressive mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and very inspiring. You know, sometimes we like to end with like sort of critiques or more things to research. I don't know, maybe what would you want to know more about that we maybe touched on all too briefly and, and maybe more things to think about down the road? Of course, I, I, I definitely have an interest in, in understanding how are these levers of influence exercised by the U.S.? Like, what do they do? Mm -hmm. um, like, practically, 
and how do they like affect these type of besides just moving money and shit, but yeah. what actually happens and maybe some way to get an idea how to counteract or prevent some of it in the future and stuff like that. So, um, of course, I'm sure the, the tactics are, are different now in, in detail, but probably the, the larger, you know, the larger goals and stuff like that are probably generally unchanged and stuff. So, I mean, maybe there's um, something for future episodes you and I can touch on, but I'm curious, you know, if you feel like there's anything from whatever, you know, study or, or reading you've done on things like coin operations and counterintelligence and mm-hmm. counterinsurgency that kind of fits into this, this sort of particular set of tactics and like strategy that, that seems to happen in these kind of operations. I know we've talked a little bit mm-hmm. about things like human terrain systems and the way that anthropologists and sociologists are employed by the military industrial complex and, and like by intelligence agencies to sort mm-hmm. of use like their own knowledge of like a country's history and politics mm-hmm. and sociological context to like basically exploit it and like be more effective in its military operations, things like that. Yeah. I mean, I will say when it comes to, I mean, at least specifically the human terrain systems and some of the, I feel like we should be uh, like, I, I have a, like a bit of, this is maybe a digression, but let me take it for a second. Do it. Like, I think that there's something definitely to be said for like how uh, academia like kind of feeds into like the military and military goals and stuff. On the other hand, I like I sometimes wonder if the human terrain system is like a little bit overemphasized mm. because I feel like as much as maybe the like bureaucracy of the military was like interested in implementing it and stuff like that from all the people that seemed to like the actual soldiers on the ground, they just like hated it and thought <laughs> it was completely useless. Mm. And like, I think that had very like, so I think that the implementation of it was like incredibly half hearted. And I sometimes wonder if it's like effect was maybe like a little bit overstated because mm. I think, I think you get from like the, like the upper, upper levels of the military, they really feel like, Oh, this is going to be great. This is exactly what counterinsurgency is going to be. And then when you get the actual soldiers on the ground, they're just like, what is this stupid shit? I just want to, <laughs> I just want to kill people and knock down doors and stuff like yeah, that, yeah, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, and so it's like, you know, I, I don't know. Like, um, I always feel like that there's like a bit of a disconnect there. Um, and it seems like when you hear, um, uh, people who have stories of, um, yeah, being actually in those times, uh, in the, in those circumstances, they don't really ever seem to listen or use any of the human mm-hmm. terrain <laughs> systems, okay. systems at all. So I, I mean, I don't know, like, it's like definitely like I'd be, I, I feel like it's a very interesting question and I'm like always kind of curious of like, were there actual effects? I mean, I will say it, it pretty much stopped functioning or like the, I think the, the program was, you know, either officially or at least just in practice, basically like closed down and stuff like that. So yeah, I was curious if it was even still like a, like a functional part of military operations. At I this didn't, point. I didn't think so. I thought that it had, huh, uh, okay. um, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe they renamed it or maybe they did other shit or maybe I just had wrong information, but I was under the impression that, that yeah, it was kind of considered, something that was a bit of a failure or something like that. So that was a long time ago. I was reading up on it and stuff. So like I said, I always feel like I was going to be more attempts, re-attempts at it and stuff like that. Yeah. So who knows? But yeah, it definitely seems like the majority of the, the actual soldiers on the ground had no interest in it and weren't actually, <laughs> we're not committed to listening to it or using it at all. So <laughs> that's a good corrective. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, who knows, but maybe there were effects and it's, and, uh, hasn't been properly talked about, but, uh, all that, uh, all that to be said, yeah, it's like, I feel like these, these type of things are like, or at least the way it's talked about, um, in these type of books and these things, it's more from like to oversimplify from like a strategic perspective of just like, this is what happened, but you don't really get an idea of what is actually happening on the ground with these 150 soldiers that came in or, you know, troops that came in mm-hmm. and definitely, I, I don't know how much he goes into the, in the book, um, describing actually like was there combat between them and the military and stuff like that it seems like they were kind of just like essentially permitted to to move into the areas that they wanted to and stuff so yeah i mean there were a couple of small sections that i kind of glossed over a little bit i mean Mm. there were actual confrontations and there were like mostly skirmishes but Mm. from what i remember the is saying i mean there were pretty fast pretty uneventful Mm. um i think mostly the the military would would retreat or he's like, like you know they would I think whenever they did encounter the the rebel forces, I think they would win like pretty pretty handedly because they just had I think superior numbers and I think you know again Armas was like kind of a shitty you know golpista fail son yeah you know so um, but, it was but just I, like the military wasn't wasn't committed to actually doing anything about it so yeah and I think like it was almost um, I mean in some ways like thinking about Operation Fortune and and the shift in in sort of approach to Operation PB Success I mean it seems like that that way of propagandizing the military was pretty 
decisive that mm. you know i think maybe it was more of whatever ground they were allowing the rebels to take was mostly out of fear of well we can't actually stop them because if we do like we're basically invoking a u.s invasion and and they knew that you know 6200 men mm. with pretty haggard equipment and you know very poorly trained you know would yeah. be no match for the u.s military especially you know like mid fifties, mm -hmm. post World War Two, like rising, right, right. you know, global superpower, mm -hmm. and so I mean, I wonder if part of it is almost like you know the the lack of like real nuance in the actual like military strategy. I mean, I'm sure there was, but I think maybe it's like glossed over by Lahasis because it's almost like well, their terror of like the U.S. invading Guatemala yeah, was exactly. so strong. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was like, yeah. You didn't didn't want to confront those those invading troops too much because yeah, you didn't want to have the U.S retaliate so yeah so yeah maybe in a lot of ways the ideological like propaganda war was the most successful one in a lot of mm. ways yeah um, speaking of that i feel like you didn't talk about bernays as much as i expected you to yeah i mean i think it's it's mostly because i think bernays was definitely like operating in terms of like public relations with ufco and mm. from what i remember he was definitely like pretty influential in like starting these like anti-guatemala campaigns about how they were stalinists and were like backed by the ussr and were just like a soviet proxy mm. and from what i remember like bernays was just very directly like influencing a lot of those campaigns for a lot mm. of other media outlets and and you know and also like defending the ufco's interests i mean he was part of their public relations team mm. and so yeah i mean i don't know i i just feel like i mean in some ways it's almost like kind of banal like mm. what he actually did i mean but that's what bernays did i mean he had a as much as i hate his guts i mean he had a pretty <laughs> uh, effective understanding of the importance of public relations and psychological influence and con conditioning and media and propaganda mm -hmm. i mean you know he was uh this, his uncle's theories uh you know, horribly and effectively. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe whenever we uh, we do our Dulles Brothers episodes, we'll we'll include some Brene stuff, and so we'll just you maybe know we'll just drag all three of them. Cool. I'm down. Yeah. So maybe um we'll do that. I don't know. Maybe after we do the the episodes on Chile maybe and uh, yeah, I mean this is gonna be an ongoing series, so we'll just kind of we'll get to it when we get to it, I guess. Cool. All right. Well, I guess on that uh that heavy note, yeah. we're gonna leave you, comrade listeners. We hope the the history of Guatemala has been. Um, if it's new, you know, you're, you're going to take a lot away from this to understand a, a larger historical context of the 20th century and, and the, the relationship to radical revolutionary politics in a place like Guatemala, the, what happened, why it happened, what was actually going on. And, um, you know, if this is history you're aware of, um, maybe you just like took some different ways to think about it from Blahesus. Cause again, I think he provides a pretty nuanced understanding that, you know, from my understanding, you don't really see a lot, even in how people talk about Guatemala on the left today. Mm. You want to send people out with one of our new show taglines? We have three. Oh, we have three. Oh, shoot. I, I wasn't briefed on this before this oh, episode. That's all right. It, these were all part of like a very <laughs> weird and obscure Discord conversation. But I guess, uh, well, you know, you know the main one that CC Alex coined. We out here. We are out here, comrades. And also, we'll just leave you with our other two newer taglines to remember to sever the people and keep yeah. your dagger sharp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is a wrap for Pierre Lajesis' Shattered Hope and this installment of Red Library's Revolutionary Politics and Central and South America series. It's been a hell of a intense and deeply tragic ride through this history. Again, I just want to give a big shout out to Radio Warner for all of their influence and inspiration for what we do here on the show. Big shout out to CC Don for really just hanging in there with me through this uh, bulldozer of a historical adventure and for all you comrade listeners for tuning in each and every week as always you can expect more icy cold motherfucking takes spicy hot analysis theoretical deep dives analytical skewering keeping our daggers sharp trying to sever the people as always if you want to know what those phrases mean join us in the discord become a patron because that's where those phrases are originating and it's honestly way too complicated and sort of weird and tangential to try to explain the context i don't even know if i remember it to be honest i just know i really like those phrases to describe what we're doing here on the show until we see you back here next time in the library remember stay hydrated stay motivated stay liberated continue to search for ways to be emancipated. Find those lost futures, find them currently, find them in the past. Keep your eyes gazing at that communist horizon, however that is defined, whatever that means, as we're all trying to figure it out together. Remember your comrades over here at Red Library, we out here. 
and also all of your pod rats at the Lost Horizons Network. We all out here all the time. Never stop podcasting. Never stop analyzing. Never stop critiquing. Never stop debating. And never stop finding the others out there. Take care of yourselves, comrades. Peace. Peace.